Anthony, I did my doctorate in neuroscience. I've been interested in consciousness my entire life. And one of the reasons is this is potentially one of the last bastions uh, for those who would claim there is something different beyond the physical world. And I would love to access that if it's real and to eliminate it if it's not. So how do you look at consciousness? Well, it is, of course, uh, a mystery and is one of the great frontiers of, of inquiry now to understand how conscious phenomena arise from, from matter. Um, the fact of, of consciousness is, seems to me indisputable. We all experience it all the time. We're all inhabiting the, 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 the core of our own conscious experience. We've learned to recognize that consciousness is very selective. It's a very small part of our mental activity. Yes. Most mental computation is non-conscious, uh, so we, we, we understand that. But it doesn't change the fact that to feel a pain, to feel a pang of love or desire, to, to, to see a beautiful array of flowers, that the, the, the qualia uh, aspect of things is something very, very vivid, very real, and of course of supreme importance to us. It's also the case we know two other things, that we recognize the presence of consciousness in non-human animals as well, in dogs and primates and uh, in lower forms of, of animals, and different levels and gradations of sentience there, so we can uh, surmise that the complexity of the nervous system has something to do with the, the, the richness or fullness of, of conscious experience. And we also know that if you take an ice pick, as uh, you know, as happened to unfortunate individuals in the past, like Trotsky, and you dig it deep enough in somebody's head, that consciousness experiences are going to be uh, rearranged or, or terminated. Um, and all the evidence seems to suggest that unless you have a functioning uh, um, brain, a higher central nervous system, you don't get consciousness associated with it. So these facts are steering us in, a, in the direction of thinking that um, neurological inquiry, that is inquiry into how different structures in the brain operate and what they're correlated with and what those correlations mean, we still don't yet fully, uh, in a, fully in a position to say that these the activation of these structures causes certain kinds of conscious phenomena. But uh, our, our increasing understanding of this shows that uh, consciousness um, may very well not be one single thing. There may be not be one uh, coordinating center of consciousness, maybe a multiple phenomena, maybe different levels and kinds of consciousness. But the fact of it uh, is indisputable and its importance is supreme. So we're not going to eliminate consciousness the way some might as sort of an internal illusion that we may have, but we have to explain it. And nobody disagrees with the uh, correlation with brain activities, that's clear. Question comes up is, can you take the category of nerve impulses, chemicals floating across uh, synapses between the neurons, can you take that category with that feeling of the internal experience of what it means to see a sunset or hear a symphony. Uh, are those categories so distinct that it, 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 it puts a significant challenge to make the correlation in, into cause or, as some would think, into identity, to where those neural events literally are those quality of those internal experiences? I think the, the powerfully justified assumption is that those those two apparently very different kinds of phenomena, the neurological phenomena, the consciousness phenomena, are in, in some sense the same thing or in some sense causally related. Um, and so the goal has to be to find out what that uh, explanation is that we can give of that. Some but say it that's be, impossible in principle. Well, it, it may be made more difficult by the fact that the vocabularies that we use to talk about these two different uh, domains are themselves incommensurable. I'll give you an example. You have a physicist and a sociologist standing next to a, a football field, uh, and the physicist describes what's happening in terms of the movement of bodies interacting according to mechanical principles and the like, uh, emitting radiation at certain frequencies. But the sociologist says uh, the ball's in play or that that was a score or that was a foul. And the terms used by the sociologist have no translation in the terms of physics, nor vice versa. That may be our difficulty, that... Intentional concepts, will, desire, memory, hope, the rest, which we use to talk about psychological and conscious phenomena, feelings and qualia and the rest, just don't seem to have a ready translation into those physiological and neurological terms used to describe the brain. Once we've overcome the vocabulary difficulty, it may be that we do find roots in uh, from one domain to the other. 
Yeah, I, I'm not sure the analogy totally holds because with the brain we have literally, it's the same organ producing it. And the other, the, you had the, the, the soccer game or the football game uh, external and two people were trying to describe the same, the same thing. Um, there's some rather radical approaches to consciousness. If you, if you believe firmly that the brain does cause consciousness, but the, the, the categories are so different, some would say that we'll be forever incapable of coming up with a, a solution to that. Others would say there's something uh, of a conscious nature in, in, in all physical things, a so-called panpsychism, and then all varieties of, uh, of dualism, some of which are religiously motivated, but a lot of which are not. Well, those people who say that we're never going to be competent to understand consciousness, I think that's, uh, you know, um, sort of giving up uh, long before we've, we've got to a point where we should. And also, of course, it's meant to be an argument in principle that we're just not structured in a way to understand ourselves. Uh, and, and I think that's a very pessimistic argument. The panpsychist argument, which says consciousness is everywhere, in fact, it's the most common phenomenon in the universe, rather empties the notion of content. Because if everything is conscious, then... It's a kind of well. To be fair, right. the claim is is that there's proto consciousness, and not that every every particle is conscious or even a chair is conscious. But when you, in order for have something to be literally conscious, the way we feel it, there has to be in the component parts of that some sort of a a, a tr tricky force or something different that, when brought together, can generate the consciousness. Well, it would, of course, be much uh, um, a, a simpler claim and, and a more plausible one to say that it's the arrangement of non-conscious elements that gives rise to consciousness, mm. rather than that in order for there to be consciousness, there has to be consciousness in the elements. It's certainly so, simpler, but the question is because the categories are so different, the simpler a explanation is it just won't work. Uh, Einstein's favorite thing is make everything as simple as possible, but not simpler. Mm -hmm. Yes, quite. Well, well, of course, the analogy really is with uh, the fact that any individual component of a motor car can't be driven from Chicago to New York, but put them together in the right mm -hmm. way, and then you can. And this is an appeal to the idea of emergent properties. A consciousness may be uh, um, a property or set of properties that arise from the right configuration and interaction of elements in our brains.